whose freedom is it anyway? That's a question we'll be looking at today because it is uh, the 3rd of May, a day that is marked around the world as World Press Freedom Day. We look at the context in which the press exists and functions today in 2023 and who enjoys actually uh, the freedom to report, the freedom to do journalism, the freedom to publish and what are the consequences that journalists around the world face for the kind of work that they do and why is it important to all of us that a free press, a pluralistic press exist and that questions be asked to those in a position of power. You're watching Daily Debrief on People's Dispatch, as always, coming to you from our studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Dhani, and besides Press Freedom Day, we'll also be talking today about important developments uh, from the United States, where the president has met with the leader of the Philippines. This links in very well with our conversation with Prashant of People's Dispatch about press freedom and democracy, of course. And we'll also talk about a largely uh, unsuccessful, or at least a breakthrough free, a uh, meeting held or hosted by the United Nations in the Qatari capital of Doha uh, that was meant to uh, chart a path forward for the multi-pronged crises that Afghanistan faces today. Like I was saying, May the 3rd marks the anniversary of the Window Declaration of a Free, Independent and Pluralistic Press. This short and specific declaration was signed by African newspaper journalists uh, in the early 90s and became a template for universal principles for press freedom and, was sub and subsequently was the inspiration for similar statements by journalists and publishers in many other parts of the world, including of course Central Asia, uh, the Middle East or West Asia, uh, as well as Latin America. The day is now celebrated as World Press Freedom Day. And today the media landscape, as a result of both neoliberal policies that also began to take hold at around the same time, as well as the information technology revolution, have drastically changed the landscape in which the media operates. Yet the core principles as well as the threats to press freedom remain the same. Journalists around the world are under attack not just from government persecution, uh, but perhaps more universally from big capital which has consolidated media ownership in the hands of the very few, the very rich, and build monoliths instead of promoting plurality. We remember today all the independent journalists around the world who have been persecuted for speaking truth to power. And as on every other day when thoughts of democracy and a free press come to mind, we consider carefully the persecution specifically of Julian Assange, uh, the publisher of WikiLeaks, hounded, persecuted and traumatized, not by a dictator of an authoritarian state, but by the United States of America and its allies, the same set of nations whose leaders tell the rest of the world what freedom is and uh, prescribe, even coerce the rest of us to follow a rules-based order in which they make and break the rules as suits their convenience. Uh, to, to talk more on this day is uh, Prashant of People's Dispatch. Uh, Prashant, obviously we can talk about a whole host of issues when it comes to press freedoms around the world. Uh, but by and large, there are some common themes around the world, whether they are self-proclaimed democratic countries or otherwise. Uh, what, how should we, as, as normal people who are consuming this vast array of uh, news and other kinds of content today available online. Uh, how are we to look at press con uh, press freedom in that context? Right, so I think, I mean, a lot of World Press Freedom Day has become about lists and rankings and, you know, all this kind of which, which country has more freedom, which country has less freedom, yeah. which is in some senses a very superficial way of looking at the issue. And I think we need to kind of sometimes go back and look at why we are celebrating this in the first place. The, this is the 30th Press free, this is the 30th uh, anniversary of the announcement of World Press Freedom Day. It was in 1993 mm. that it was officially announced. Uh, but <clears throat> this itself was a follow-up of what is called the Windhoek Declaration that came out in 1991 on the 3rd of May. And I urge everyone to sort of go back. It's a very short document which kind of talks about, you know, uh, where basically a group of African journalists gathered at a meeting and they talked about some of the issues facing press freedom. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the issues that were mentioned there, they're still very relevant today. Because it was not, say, very, you know, uh, uh, sort of very vague statements about democracy and freedom mm -hmm. and all that. It was really concrete issues that deter journalists from practicing uh, journalism. Now, some of this, of course, is repressive laws, jailing of journalists by government, repression of journalists in various ways. But others also are about economic factors. For instance, the presence of monopolies, mm. you know, the kind of impact they have yeah. on journalism. The fact, for instance, that uh, often economic reasons are why 
journalists are not able to do their work. Mm. There includes their own wages, of course, but also something like, say, the cost of newsprint. Yeah. Right. So how all of these actually were affecting journalism, which seeks to speak truth to power, which mm. is ultimately the aim of all good journalism. Mm. For, for instance, the document continuously emphasizes on the role of, uh, say, for, uh, journalist unions, which can actually present a strong face and protect journalists from any kind of repression, any kind of threats. That's been a very key aspect. Mm. The document uh, specifies a lot about training, for instance. And the spirit of the document, uh, the Windhoek Declaration, actually is of a very cooperative understanding of journalism, yeah. where you know journalists across the world kind of pool in their resources, work to help each other, uh, and you know sort of help to spread the news, as opposed to this cutthroat industry mm. we're seeing today, where you know everyone. Who breaks the um, story? Know, and there are like 10 TV channels pointing a camera at the same incident and all of them saying we are doing breaking news. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whereas there's nothing breaking uh, or, or they're saying the exclusive news, you yeah. know, where there's nothing exclusive about it at all. Yeah. Right. So uh, the media landscape has changed considerably in the years since that declaration, of course. The declaration also coming out maybe even a more idealistic time maybe mm -hmm. it's the end of a particular age in history mm -hmm. the you know the beginning of what is called the neoliberal reforms mm -hmm. in many parts of the world mm -hmm. you know uh, politicians uh, big corporates realizing the value of actually swallowing up large uh, new a large number of newspapers constructing these massive mon media monopolies which have changed and this was also of course before social media brought with it its own challenges to journalism yeah. as well so today the picture is way way more complicated mm. but i think the key aspects uh, still continue the fact that we need that. to look at journalism as uh, you know not not as some kind of idealistic thing which uh, idealists practice you know vague slogans of mm. democracy and all that but as concrete work done by journalists who face concrete limitations mm. And whose and many of these limitations are very structural. Mm. And the question I think on World Freedom Press Freedom Day is how do we sort of uh, transcend some of these structural restrictions that are there? You know, <clears throat> the restrictions in terms of how the state influences uh, media coverage, not just directly to censorship or repression, yeah. but also through a variety of instruments which create a consensus, like Chomsky said, which manufacture consent. consent. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, so all these are like very big challenges to sort of think about today. Uh, it's interesting to note that this has also been a time of resistance. Uh, there have been a lot of independent journalists who, despite not getting a platform in what is in, in corporate media have nonetheless continued to strive. Mm. Uh, we've been talking about Julian Assange next. That's he's a very good example. Yeah. But I think it's very important to sort of sit back and look at the journalism overall uh, in today's context and kind of try to think through some of these issues. Mm. Uh, Assange, we brought up and 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 it remains in in these times. I suppose uh, the biggest example of, uh, or, or at least the most globally talked about example, to whatever extent it is talked about. Uh, that that persecution continues, uh, and and despite this, some of these elements of uh, understanding the news world as a team sort of effort, team sport in that sense, hasn't really translated, and particularly in these uh, you know mega media and uh, corporations that have come up. Uh, so how do you look at what's happening with Assange and uh, the direction in which the broader news media is headed today? Right. Uh, I mean, I think like you, you hinted at that, but Assange is not talked about enough because yeah. if it, he were talked about enough, this would be <coughs> universally anytime someone in the United States talks about democracy, uh, you know, the first thing people should think about is Assange, right? Anytime <clears throat> Joe Biden or, you know, any of, the, any of his ministers or, you know, any of those U.S. cultural figures say that the U.S. is a shining exemplar of democracy, the question then should be what about Assange? Mm. Because <coughs> what Julian Assange did is... Uh, release information about war crimes, about atrocities committed by the United States. Uh, he published those uh, that information, which is revealed by, uh, revealed revealed to him by Chelsea Manning. Mm. Both of them suffered a lot of torment for that. Assange continuing to remain in torment. Assange in jail in the United Kingdom in Belmarsh Prison on no charges, by mm. the way, mm. because they're still to determine uh, if he can be extradited to the United States. And if he is extradited there, he's going to face a fresh trial. Yeah. Almost everyone is assured that the trial is going to lead to him being declared guilty. Mm. A journalist who is facing SPNR charges, mm. which is again a first. So all these are very, uh, you know, and I think the reason Assange is being targeted so much is basically that he revealed the dirty underbelly, so to speak, of the United States. He exposed all the claims that the US 
has been using to push its through its soft power pushing across the world making itself this kind of dream destination as mm. showed that this is how the us military works it kills innocent people in iraq this is how the us works in afghanistan this is how the us diplomatic cables work interfering across the world he helped uh, edward snowden escape who made his own revelations so for this crime for basically exposing the crimes of the united states mm. uh, that is assange's crime mm. right so and uh, do, and doing his job exactly so i think what assange showed on the one hand was the possibilities of journalism in today's age mm. a small operation mm. can tap into the conscience mm. of people who are unhappy with the system and have such a huge impact you don't need a newsroom with uh, 800 or 1000 journalists all yeah. you need is a small operation which is able to provide a particular technological the particular technological infrastructure to release information which can you know severely embarrass mm. uh, and uh, you know p- make people ask questions of those in power mm. and i think this asymmetric journalism that he practiced is mm. the reason he is uh, in uh, <clears throat> jail today and it's also a warning to those who might seek who might seek to do similar things because yeah. uh the bigger these empires grow the bigger the us empire grows the bigger that uh, you know their spread is their weaknesses are also start to get bigger right mm, so mm. there are possibilities that many others could follow his path so mm. it is also an attempt to deter mm. people from doing that mm. the good news is that people haven't stopped it that this exp- this experience has actually inspired more people to sort of work in these areas Uh, the state the us state you know, the calvas culture the paratus the social media platforms try their best to sort of stop it but i think the underlying message is that such resistance continues all right thanks prashant uh, for talking to us this world press freedom day or maybe we should take a, a page out of the abalali book and uh, rechristen it world yeah. unpress freedom day uh, uh, press on freedom press day, on yes. freedom day all right thanks for right. joining us the head of government of the philippines ferdinand marcos junior has met with joe biden the leader of the free world and the president of the united states the two countries are of course firm friends and allies and the us's role uh, in and support for right wing regimes in the philippines is just one illustration of the hypocrisy of the west uh, particularly when when it comes to issues like we were discussing with prashant just earlier of human rights and press freedoms and of course in the wider sense the idea of democracy itself anish covers the region for people's dispatch and has been uh, looking at what came out of that meeting between the two leaders Anish uh, Uncle Joe welcoming uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr uh, a bit like an old family friend being you know reunited after after a long time uh, and uh, sort of following up on the meeting with the South Korean leader uh, kind of shoring up their allies in in the region uh, what were the highlights of the meeting between the US and the Philippines uh, and and what should we be looking at in terms of uh, this uh, friendship going forward yeah so uh, it's uh, good that you mentioned the uh, the manner in which uh, marcus junior was uh, welcomed into the white house uh, the very uh, line that uh, i should actually quote him uh, verbatim at this point uh, the very line that he used was welcome back to the white house we talked over the phone we talked on the way over it's been a while since you've been here <laughs> and you've been here uh, under president regan with your father now this is like a very clear admission of how strong uh, us relations were uh, with the marcos uh, dictatorship in mm-hmm. philippines uh, but somehow like uh, none of the uh, the spin masters uh, in the biden administration thought it was not wise to actually mention that part uh, during a very crucial visit where you're presenting yourself as uh, champions of democracy at this point and uh, so obviously yeah uh, but that aside we have to also talk about the fact that uh, this is very clearly uh, a way to shore up uh, n- not only allies but also uh, make a show of strength of sorts uh, with its allies in the region in the indo pacific uh, with regards to china obviously the target is always china at this point we have mm. seen this since january where there was kitshida meeting uh, biden and then you had yoon very recently and now it's marcos junior and so in all three cases uh, the substance of the meeting wasn't that much it was merely a show of strength uh, what was achieved was something uh, just of, uh, just optics at this point and not really a clear concrete commitments uh even though commitment commitments were made but uh, well us is at this point where it is even trying to 
uh, deal with its own debt crisis. Uh, and uh, so it is not it is not a mere commitment that can be assured by the president. It also needs to come with the Congress. And if the Congress is not agreeing to the same kind of conditions, obviously we are looking at a different kind of... But nevertheless, this meeting has been presented as this very positive uh, outcome uh, between two allies. Uh, and in each of these cases, and Marcos Jr.'s visit is no different. Mm. Uh, it's also a World Press Freedom Day, Anish, as you're no doubt aware. We've talked about... Uh, conditions faced by the press in the Philippines uh, and by their own admission they, they are talking about how this is geopolitically a region that is the most volatile in the world uh, which at this at the moment of time in which we live it's, it's no small uh, sort of statement to make uh, with flashpoints all, all over. Uh, so, so in both of these contexts and you mentioned of course uh, how the US is positioning it, itself as the champion and the upholder of of uh, freedom and democracy, uh, just in, in all uh, with, with with all of that background, Anish, uh, how do we understand the U.S.'s role uh, in the region, and and to uh, to the extent uh, or the extent uh, to which all of these sort of optics are designed, uh, maybe to just give themselves a pep talk. Yeah, it is more or less a pep talk at this point, because uh, if you look at the substance of uh, what has been achieved with these meetings, it's not really much. Uh, there were, uh, you know, uh, there were actually just reinforcement of commitments that were made earlier. Uh, in this case, uh, in case of Marcos Jr., you had the EDCA sites. We've talked about that, the military, the the military bases, or which the U.S. refuses to call military bases, mm -hmm. uh, that the uh, Philippines is giving access to the United States. Um, and also, obviously, statements about uh, U.S. standing uh, uh, standing with Philippines against China uh, in the South China Sea. So, obviously, these are similar statements that were made earlier. It is nothing new. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, you definitely have movements uh, not only in the U.S., but also in the Philippines, talking about, uh, you know, a very clear danger of militarization in the region. And this is something that we have seen across the board, across the region, where, uh, be it in Taiwan, be it uh, in South Korea, in Japan, uh, in all of these cases, there were moments that were calling out their administration's very reckless uh, posturing uh, when it comes to the tensions between China and the U.S., where mm. they're trying to use provocations of different sort uh, uh, against China and using that as uh, a leverage to gain whatever uh, little uh, benefits they can get from the United States. Mm. And that is definitely going to be a big problem. In the case of the Philippines right now, obviously there is a very clear silence on the state of not only press freedoms, as we all uh, as we all talk about press freedom today, uh, there is complete uh, silence on that matter. There is there has been complete silence on the recent killing of uh, Percy Lapid, and uh, we saw that uh, when Kamala Harris visited the Philippines and Palawan itself, uh, and she was actually asked uh, about the state of press freedom in the country, and she refused to make any. Kind of clear statement on that matters. It shows mm. that the U.S. administration is not keen on actually, uh, you know, pr promoting or advocating for democracy or uh, you know civil liberties across the world. It is only more, uh, more, more or less uh, concerned about containing China. And we also need to know, talk about how Philippines continues to remain one of the most dangerous countries for civil society organizers where, uh, you know, apart from cer certain countries in the Latin America, Philippines continues to be the one, the most deadliest place for any kind of not only environmental defend uh, defenders, but also land defenders and people who, uh, you know, organize as trade unionists and yeah. so on in the country. And this is, uh, you know, just seen in simple numbers where you have dozens of killings, extrajudicial and, you know, very random assassinations happening every year and there is literally no talk about that coming from the u.s administration on both sides uh, neither the republicans or the democrats want to touch on that and so this is something that is very clearly sidelined uh, and we did not see that kind of silence when it was Duterte, because obviously Duterte took a very pragmatic position in geopolitically where it did not very overtly side with the united states but uh, when it comes to marcus jr the friendliness is paying 
off with the kind of uh, you know whitewashing that the US administration is ready to do in this case. All right. Thanks, Anish, for uh, giving us uh, uh, all the latest on the unspinnable activities of uh, Uncle Joe Biden, uh, but also uh, also kind of uh, giving us a little more context, particularly in, in the light of what's been coming out of Beijing uh, over the recent weeks and months, which has been a lot more sort of constructive in the point of uh, dialogue as well as resolving a lot of these regional conflicts uh, in, by involving regional players itself. Thanks. Uh, two days of uh, talks have ended in Doha involving around 25 countries and hosted by United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Uh, the talks were of course uh, aimed at uh, finding some kind of common ground to help reach a resolution to the multiple crises that uh, Afghanistan is facing at present. Uh, unsurprisingly though, from reports that are emanating from Doha, there have been no major breakthroughs uh, after these two days of discussions, uh, which included several neighboring countries, uh, including the likes of, of course, India, Pakistan, uh, and others. Uh, not surprising, perhaps, because the de facto head of uh, the government in Afghanistan, which is the Taliban, were not, in fact, invited to attend or participate in these talks, uh, mostly because there is significant opposition uh, from many countries to, uh, in fact, recognizing the Taliban as the government in power in Afghanistan. Uh, to talk more on the subject, uh, Abdul joins us. Uh, Abdul, uh, like I was just saying, uh, how successful can you even expect a discussion like this to be if uh, the powers that be on the ground uh, that are, in fact, ruling Afghanistan as things stand at present uh, are not even participating in the discussion at all? Well, that, that is one point which was raised by the Taliban officials as well, that this entire exercise is fruitless, there is no meaning behind it if we are not invited. Of course, but one should understand the dilemma in which the entire uh, 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 the meeting was held. Mm. Uh, 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 on, on one point, there were uh, objections to what Taliban's Taliban government, de facto government in Afghanistan is doing vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the women in particular, mm. and also about uh, the, the, the failure of various countries uh, across the globe to, un uh, to basically recognize the necessity of engaging with the authorities on the ground. So there were different levels of contradictions and uh, disagreements, which basically the organizers, in particular the UN, uh, were unable to resolve. Mm. And that basically led to uh, this particular situation in which uh, the, the talks were held on the condition of uh, Afghan economy, on uh, terrorism, on the condition of women, in important issues, of course, given the fact that the majority of the uh, Afghans are facing uh, unprecedented economic crisis, almost 100% of the Afghan population is not able to meet their basic needs for various reasons. Of course, one of the basic reasons is the the, the decades-long war and uncertainty and so on. So, so in that particular situation where there is a de facto administration there, even that was not invited. And it seems, uh, uh, to be uh, fair to the organizers, there was uh, uh, no fault of theirs, mm -hmm. at least. So uh, this peculiar situation, it seems we are unable to pinpoint who is responsible behind that. But the, yeah, that is the situation, yeah. Uh, so, uh, we'll, I, I guess next we can talk a bit about the UNDP, United Nations Development Program report that has also come out detailing some of uh, the uh, specific aspects of the economic crisis that is currently uh, on in Afghanistan. It is, of course, nothing uh, new in that sense, Abdul. We've talked about it often on uh, this show as well and elsewhere on People's Dispatch. Uh, so, so, there seems to be an understanding of uh, what is happening from an economic standpoint, at least in Afghanistan, and also what factors have led us to this point. Uh, in that context, was this, did this meeting uh, eventually boil down to what kind of a response uh, the so-called international community will have to the situation in Afghanistan? And, and is it looking at those aspects more than actually uh, long-term, more plan, where, which involves, again, people who are on the ground and actually uh, running things? 
No, uh, uh, unfortunately, no. In fact, the uh, the, the 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 very rigid uh, stand which Taliban has taken vis-a-vis -vis the condition of women has provided an excuse to uh, countries such as United States and the European Union, which are holding a substantial amount of Afghan fund, which mm. can be, can be very useful. Uh, in tackling some of the economic aspects in the country. Yeah. So uh, basically they have uh, what we call the shot the, uh, themselves in arm uh, and be, uh, because of the rigid uh, stand on women uh, question. And that uh, uh, there, are, there are no uh, explanation uh, if one looks, try to uh, understand why Taliban is doing this particular thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is no rational explanation. There were talks, if if we remember, when uh, uh, the, the the U.S. was withdrawing and the Taliban was taking over. There were talks of this being Taliban 2.0, different from what Taliban was in 1996 and yeah. uh, in the first uh, during the first uh, its first rule. And uh, the and, and spokesperson after spokesperson coming from Taliban claiming that we basically respect the women and respect their right to be in public domain. We will do everything to uh, make sure that they, that they they are allowed to get education, they are allowed to uh, uh, participate, do, in the uh, workforce. participate in the workforce and so on and so forth. But none of those promises have materialized and it seems in uh, more ways than the other that the, this Taliban government is not any different from what the, uh, the first Taliban government was. And that basically provides an excuse to, uh, as I said before, the, to the countries which basically have, uh, uh, have an interest in withholding uh, the uh, Afghan funds. Uh, and, 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 and that basically creates a, a kind of a status quo, a, crime, a, crime, a kind of a, a situation where even the uh, organizations such as UN, uh, which is, uh, uh, willing to and pushing for uh, yeah. uh, more and more engagements with the Taliban government uh, uh, on ground is unable to convince. Uh, in fact, there are reports that UN is reviewing its own presence yeah. in Afghanistan uh, because of the particular thing that uh, even the Taliban government has banned women from participating in UN activities as well. So mm. this uh, rigidity is basically, uh, which is Un irrational, unexplainable, is basically providing, uh, 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 basically deteriorating the situation further. Uh, as I said before, the, uh, almost the entire country, the almost 100% of Afghans today, uh, more than uh, around 30, uh, 30 million uh, Afghans are unable to meet their basic uh, uh, necessities. Uh, and, and, and it seems that there is no one which can do anything about it. Yeah. And, 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 and unconscionable also the rigidity that the Taliban is bringing to the table at this point. A quick reminder to our viewers, of course, that over 7 billion US dollars in Afghan central bank funds just in the United States have been frozen. The European Union has also frozen assets, assets that could well, as Abdul was pointing out, have been used to at least alleviate some of the material uh, difficulties and, and humanitarian concerns that are facing a uh, vast majority of Afghans, uh, including millions and millions of uh, women and children, of course. Uh, thanks, Abdul, for, for that update today, uh, even though, I mean, there was not really much of an update as such, uh, but thanks for joining us. So, on this uh, occasion of World Press Freedom Day or Press Unfreedom Day, uh, depending on how you look at it, we, of course, thank you all for your support and for following People's Dispatch. If, if you haven't liked and subscribed, uh, please do so now. We also, as always, invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Uh, give us a follow on social media platforms for updates and keep a track on all of the work we do. You can also get in touch, write into us with your comments, your thoughts, as well as your feedback on the shows that we do. Uh, we'll be back with another episode of The Daily Debrief from, on the same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Thank you.